What does everybody want? Hey, what's going on, everybody? My name is Tim McCarthy. You're tuning into another episode of 20 Tim Minutes. I am very happy today that we have on professional wrestler, most popular for his time during the Attitude Ever Attitude Era from the WWF, now called the WWE, Al Snow. Al, how the hell are you? Great. If I read better, I'd be jealous of myself. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, no, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, so you've been in the business since about the early 80s, correct? Can you briefly explain? Uh, May 22nd, 1982 was the very first match I'd ever had. So it's been uh, 39 years now that I've been in uh, professional wrestling. Majority of that being an in-ring performer, but I've done commentary. Um, I've been a host. I've been... Um, you know, I've sat down, set up, tore down rings. I've um, been a promoter. Uh, I'm now the CEO of uh, Gladiator Sports Network, uh, which is the parent company of OVW, which is Ohio Valley Wrestling, which was the former developmental program for WWE. Um, I was the um, was the uh, head trainer for three very successful seasons of Tough Enough on MTV. Yep. Trainer and consultant for WWE's developmental program when it was a part in association with uh, OVW at that time. And um, I've worked as a produce, backstage producer, uh, segment producer, uh, road agent, what we call them in wrestling, and, uh, and um, been an executive with uh, Impact Wrestling. And uh, um, stay yeah. busy. Just now I'm. Now I'm, uh, you know, part owner of OVW and, and um, looking forward to the future. That's awesome. Um, are you officially retired from Ingring ring wrestling? Not quite yet. Um, I'm more of uh, semi-retired. Um, I had in um, October, I uh, had both, both of my knees were replaced um, just from the years of abuse. So they're not 100% uh, completely done. They're they're really good and they're much better and I live without pain now, but um, they're not where I feel 100% comfortable that they need to be where they need to be so that I can not be an embarrassment when I get in the ring. Fair enough. Fair enough. Can you briefly explain what made you get into professional wrestling? Uh, yeah, I can't. Um, I can't tell you. I don't know. Um and, you know, I may, I try to explain that to people that if, if you have a passion for something that you truly want to do, um, one, you shouldn't be able to explain what motivates you to do it. You just feel drawn to it and, and you feel like you have to do it. If it's, a, if it's something that you can't explain, that you can justify to someone else in their mind as to why you pursued it, um, you probably shouldn't do it. You know, it's not really, it's not going to be for you. Um, and the, the other reason, uh, the other way I can answer it too is that, you know, um, no matter what I tell you, uh, no matter how much I explain it, you're not going to understand um, what it is that drives me to do it and then keeps me in it and makes me put up with the things that I do that you would consider a sacrifice that I consider just part and parcel of everyday life of what I have to do to be doing what I love to do. So, you know, uh, for those that get it, get it. Those that don't, won't. And, uh, you know, so I don't worry about it anymore. Yeah, you stay busy. I think staying busy just overall is always good for the mind and body. Just keep moving. Body in motion stays in motion. Well, yeah, I mean, your, your body is much like a car. You know, if you buy a car and you want to keep it and, you know, you set it, even if you set it inside and out of the weather and, all of that. You don't drive it. You know, it's like, oh, I want to keep this car pristine. I don't want it to ever, I don't want to ever do anything to damage it or, or take its value away. But the problem is that, you know, the oil congeals, the gasoline turns to varnish, the rubber on all the parts on the hoses and the belts and the tires dry rot, you know, um, and, uh, and eventually the car just falls apart because it's not moving. And, you know, I think the human body is much the same way. You know, it's you're meant to be moving, to be going. And, uh, you know, even when you're you're down a little bit, you need to move to some degree to keep things, 
keep things processing and keep things going. And to restart something's always tough to get back in the motion. So you're trying to turn that engine on, just not turn it over. And you're like, all right, I guess, I guess it's over. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's never over until you finally just sit down and quit. Yeah. You know, that's why I don't understand when I see all this stuff about failure and making mistakes and, and I don't know, how can you make a mistake? I, I, quite honestly, how can you make a mistake? I mean, really, you do things, you try th things that didn't work. Well, that's not a mistake. That's called experience. You know, and, um, you know, and, and I, I don't believe in failure. I don't think that it's possible to fail, um, you know, because if you're out there and you're trying and you're doing something, it may, you may not have reached the destination because I think that's, that's everybody today is everybody's got a destination in mind. You don't just do stuff because you enjoy it. It makes you happy. Well, I, 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 I'll be happy when I reach this destination. When I reach this destination, I'm successful. I haven't reached half the destinations in, in my career, but I'm I'm very happy and I feel like I was very successful. So, you know, a lot of experiences. I like that, it. That's all life is. Yeah, I really, after all these years, I've gotten to believe that all it is, good or bad, but they're all just experiences that give you great stories. As long as you survive at the end of them, you know, you can when you're you know 20 years older or something. You can look back and you can have some really good stories to tell people. And, uh, you know, um, I always I always give this advice to anybody, and that is in 10 years, I promise you, in 10 years, you will regret much, much more the things you did not do than you ever will the things you did. I agree. So if I fuck up this interview, it's just going to be the Al Snow experience. <laughs> okay. You can't fuck it up. There's no way to do it. Exactly. I love that. I absolutely love that. Now, I would say overall, your career is still a success overall. Um, it wasn't all highs, I would assume. What was your career like early on? Oh, yeah. yeah. Learning, uh, paying dues. Everybody pays dues. Every decision you make has price, has consequence. Um, so you never stop, uh, you know, paying, paying dues. Um, you know, I still pay them today. Um, um, at some point I'm wondering when it'll ever come to an end that I'll stop paying dues, but I don't think it ever will. Um, but you have to learn. And the only way that you can learn is through experience. I think too many people misinterpret, uh, access to information as it, that it equates to knowledge and nothing can be further from the truth. Um, we all have access to information, tons of it because of the wonderful little devices in our pockets. Um, but that doesn't mean you have knowledge about a particular topic or subject. In order to have real knowledge, you have to gain that through a commensurate amount of experience to couple with the information. And then together you have an understanding which would equate to knowledge. Um, and uh, starting out in wrestling, you know, you, you go through a lot where you make, mis you know, you, you uh, get taught a lot of hard lessons, um, but you learn through those experiences and now you have a better understanding of what's what to do why to do it what's expected you know uh, the etiquette of how to behave and both in the ring and backstage and in that world and um you know uh i made no money at that time because i was not an attraction you know i was not a draw um in the entertainment business you're paid not based on the services you provide or the skills that you perform, you're paid based on how many people will pay to see you do it. And uh, at that time, you know, I was plus one other match or additional all-stars or other exciting bouts. My name wasn't even on a, a piece of advertisement. So, you know, I always got the very last portion or percentage of the gate. A lot of times it wasn't much. And, uh, you know, um, I had to heat food on the engine of my car and, that I bought at a gas station lots of times. Uh, I intimately am aware of what spam tastes like and Vienna sausages and crackers and things like that. Um, but, you know, during that time, it was probably the most fun I've ever had in my life. You know, um, I was having a blast and don't regret any of it. And, uh, you know, if I had to go do it again, I'd do it all over again. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, so you're from a, um, older generation, not older, but a different yeah. time where it was mentally tough. Like, how were you mentally? I feel like back then you were like, you just have to swallow it. You have to man up. Did you have like 
tough times, you're like, oh, fuck this, I'm done, or I just beat you up? Um, sure, yeah, yeah. I had plenty uh, of uh, times that were, you know, made me, um, I'd be so frustrated, I'd be so resentful or angry. Um, but the reason that a lot of that was caused was because I was pointing the finger everywhere else but at myself. And then when I realized I can't control anybody but me, well, then I started taking control of me. And the more I took control of me, the more all of that started to go away. Um, the more I uh, tried to victimize myself, the more I tried to blame or hold responsible, uh, you know, other people and my situation, the more I stayed in that situation and the more, um, you know, the more trials and challenges I faced and the more beaten and downtrodden I felt. And, and I literally decided that, well, I can either, you know, I can only, control, I can't control them and I can't control the circumstance. I can control me and what I do with it. And, and that made the biggest difference, made the big change. So that was your defining moment to keep on pushing? Well, I think the only real talent I think I've ever had is that I just don't quit. Um, and maybe a lot of people in, in a similar situation would have probably thought, you know, maybe I, you should, you know, but I didn't have a plan A. I didn't have a plan B. I didn't have, I, I, this was what I wanted to do. It was not a, I made a conscious decision. This was what I was going to do. And, and at that point, there was no turning back. So. You know, there was one time, but again, that was during the time that I was pointing the finger at everybody else that, you know, I got to a point where I was like, well, maybe I just should take up pro bowling, you know, not that I'm a good bowler, but maybe I'd have a better chance at it. And, uh, um, but then I, I came out of it, came out on the other side and, you know, and uh, I've been able to go to, I think, 40, 48 or 49 different countries, you know, I've some of them I've visited numerous times. I've gotten to see things and do things that other people only read about on the internet or in books, experience things that I would never have imagined I would have experienced, meet people and, you know, um, and um, form relationships that I never would have formed or met if it hadn't been for making the decision to do what I do. And, uh, you know, that that's what it comes down to. Don't buy the bullshit. I tell everybody this these days because everybody wants to be a victim. Everyone who wants to point the finger at everybody else. And, and we all want to say that our circumstances, our cross that we're bearing is always heavier than anybody else's. For one, it's not a competition, you know. And for another, you just, you don't know who's got what or how heavy it is, but it's not, you can only control you. So take control of your own life. Make your decisions. Quit being, quit being a victim. Start being a person that just does what they want to do. Quit worrying about what other people think. Yeah. They're gonna think it anyways, so fuck them. Yeah, that is the toughest thing to get over. I feel like for a lot of people's uh, other people's thoughts, but you just gotta just gotta keep pushing and just kick everyone in the mouth, uh, preferably. We just, you know, you just do what you want to do and do what makes you happy. Exactly. And you know, it, it, happiness is not a destination. It's just you can make the choice to be happy. Nobody makes you feel anything. That's the that's the truth. I mean, emotions you can't control, but really, at the end of the day. I would say something to you and you were to get, you know, either angry or upset or, or despondent or depressed or sad. I didn't do it. I didn't, I said the same thing for each one of those emotions. You though, interpreted whatever I said, and then you decided to react that way. You know, you can decide not to also. I mean, that's, it's crazy, but you can, I mean, and, and the choice is yours. Yeah. And that's why, and you, you also have to, you know, another thing I've learned in life is that I don't really get too upset about and have it for a long time about what people think about me, because in order for me to worry about what you think about me, I have to respect your opinion. And there ain't many that I really give two shits about what they think. So. Yeah. I feel like the most part, Al Snow was a very lovable guy. Everyone loved him in the 90s. Let's fast forward to the 90s. Al Snow starts to get hot, starts to get over. A lot of people listen to this podcast that might not be wrestling fans. For the non-wrestling fans out there, how would you describe Al Snow the wrestler? Uh, for a long time, Al Snow the wrestler was, was a uh, – uh, you could believe that Al Snow was actually out there trying to – win a match you could you could believe in what 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 he was selling 
Um, and then um, when I realized it wasn't just about what I did, but who and why I did it, then you could believe in who I was. And that was the most important thing is if you can believe in who I am, you'll believe in anything I do. And, um, and I took great pains to ensure that people would believe in who I was, you know, as much as possible. And that was what really ultimately made me an attraction that made me go up the ladder that made me people pay attention was because you could believe in who I was and uh, the why I already had the, the, you know, I was too focused on doing the what and um, people don't care about the what they care about the who. And if they can, if you can turn to your friends, regardless of what, whether it's a movie or an, it's an actor, it's music, and you can describe to your friend that person or act or band, if you can describe them in a sentence or less, that's why they're a star, is because you can go, hey, you got to watch this show or you got to come to this concert because there's this and it's A, B, C, D, E. And you've had that experience where you've been moved or motivated, not by necessarily just what they did, but who they were. And that's what drove you to want to see them again. And then that's what drove you to try to get your friends and family to come see them too. And that ultimately, being a star means that you're a box office attraction. And that's what matters. Being famous don't mean, they don't mean anything. Everybody wants to be famous until they're famous. Fame and celebrityism is nothing more than a tool to acquire more opportunities, to become more famous and have more celebrityism, to be able to acquire more opportunities. That's all it's for. It's just to tell a producer or director that you already got established an audience that they can invest their money in and that you got a good, they got a good chance of selling that movie, that project, that music to that audience to where they can recoup their money and make more. And they, in turn, can have a better reputation and want to make more opportunities to do the same thing. Sold for. Your character was very over with the crowd. You had great in-ring work. That obviously that's what that's what everyone loved about you, but I think everyone loved your actual character. Uh to explain it, you were pretty much, I would say, like a schizophrenic person that came out with a head, which would be a pretty much a doll head that he would come out with. So the people that can try to get a visual of that and a great set of hair by the way you had oh, thank you. phenomenal hair back then and you still do you, i'm bald so you still got a great set of hair uh, what was it, like it used to be <laughs> what was it about al snow that just people loved about that character that you could believe in it that it was really me you know um you know unlike actors you know uh, if wrestlers are not actors um the closest that we would be as far as acting would be like a method actor, somebody who adopts the character. Because in, an actor is somebody who can take on the role, the character of somebody they've never been. And, you know, wrestlers, uh, the reason that it works is because it is who they really are, just the volumes turned way up. And the audience can feel that and sense that. Steve Austin is really Steve Austin. He just turns, cranks it up full more. Vince McMahon really is Vince McMahon, but he just turns it to the max to be the character he lets that guy out you know at that time i was i was very frustrated and had a bad attitude and, um and he came through in my behavior with the head you know the uh uh i went so far um because in wrestling it's very important that you you give the audience what what they've paid to see they can, so they can, you know, they want to believe in um, who you are. And um, I traveled a lot by myself and uh, I would go after shows, uh, you know, I'd stop at a restaurant or something and go in to eat. I'd take the head in with me to eat, and sit at the table, and buy dinner for both of us and sit there and argue with them and, you know, about who's going to pay the bill. And people would watch that and see that, you know, and, uh, you know, and, and I think that's, you know, if you were to ask nine out of 10 people back then, uh, if I were insane, they'd swear that I was, you know, and, you know, that's, you have to do those kinds of things. It seems crazy, but, you know, that if you're watching TV and you saw me with your family in a restaurant, you're immediately like, hey, come in here. That's that guy from the restaurant. That guy's really crazy. He was talking to Ed, remember? And now you believe in who I am. 
And now, because you believe in who I am, you'll believe in anything I do, no matter how ridiculous it seems in the world of professional wrestling. I love I love picturing you at a restaurant with head and just having two meals. Um, yeah. So yeah, he carried around a head. Now, is this true? Where did you find head? Was it in an ECW match and where people brought weapons and it was part of New Jacks? Yeah, I I had a styrofoam head and I started getting um, um, these mannequin heads. I would buy. They had a really thin plastic face on them because it was a styrofoam head and that was and it was a staple to it because I knew I needed one with a, a face or yeah. human likeness. And um, um, but I would crack them; they would break. They were very fragile. And uh, Mikey Whipwreck and Spike Dudley, um, the fans would bring weapons for New Jack to use. But the ECW shows and in New Britain, Connecticut, they brought somebody brought a. Um, Putitian's mannequin head and it was in the barrel and uh, they got it out for me and gave it to me. And, and, you know, we've been together ever since. So, so there's some random guy out there that helped create head and he has probably no idea about it. Uh, probably. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, was, yeah. I think I met the guy once and he, he had stole that from his sister who had been in, in a beautician college and, um, and brought it that night for new Jack to use. And I, they got it for me, and I kept it with me ever since. Love it. Rest in peace, New Jack, by the way. Yeah. I feel like um, this might happen, too. I could be wrong. When your action figure came out, that action yeah. figure got in a lot of hot water because you had a quote-unquote decapitated head with that, and yes. mothers came out after you. How, how was that? Uh, not mothers. There were only two. There were two women who were, of all things, assistant professors of communications at a college in Georgia, from what I understand. And they showed up at a Walmart and much like today, um, it have, it's, you know, I think I was one of the first victims of cancel culture um, because what they did was they jumped to conclusions, they made assumptions and did no homework, none on the character, saw the packaging and just jumped to the conclusion that it was a, a, a severed woman's head when I've never referred to it in any kind of male or female manner, mm -hmm. always in an asexual manner. And um, that wasn't bad. What was bad was that they then decided to espouse their opinion in a public forum by writing a letter to the Atlanta Constitution. And um, they, of course, the Atlanta Constitution printed it because wrestling was very, very hot at that moment. And the minute that they printed it, Walmart freaked out ban the action figure i'm still number five on the 21 things that walmart won't sell for fear or danger to the community um number one is pregnant barbie so i was beat out by pregnant barbie <laughs> who would have thought uh, but you still can buy weapons that you can shoot people with and hunting knives that you can then dice up your uh victim in. but you can't buy my action figure because his i quote the letter uh, it was a training manual for future spousal abusers. So, do you still own that action figure? Oh yeah, yeah, I still have it, and I was thrilled. I mean, it was a week and a half. I was a national news event, so you know it was awesome. Publicity's publicity, right? Yeah, I don't care. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Especially when you think about how asinine the whole thing was in the first place, because that's why. See, why would I care? Because. Yeah. Again, it's it's two people that were completely uneducated about the topic that they wanted to talk about in a public forum. So why am I going to get upset about them? Um, I wrote them a thank you letter and told them thank you because they sold the action figure out. I made a ton of money. So good for, you know, good. Do it again. Complain some more about me. I don't care. They, def they definitely thought you were legit crazy, which maybe. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then I cut a woman's head off. Two weeks later, um, Johnny Depp's movie Sleepy Hollow came out and there they had action figures from Sleepy Hollow with two actual decapitated heads in it. Nobody said a word. Yeah, that is right. I can't believe that was the same year. I wouldn't have, I would yeah. not remember that. It was two weeks later. Yeah. Now, how do you think the Al Snow character would get over today? I think it would still, because it's it's real. That's the key in in any live performance. A, you know, um, it's the key with stand-up comedy and professional wrestling do hold certain similarities. And the best comedians, the comedians that are real and honest with who they are. 
And, um, and the same goes with professional wrestling. You know, you need wrestlers that are, that you can believe in who they are and, and why they're doing it. And, um, and I think it would, it would get over again. You know, the big myth or the big misnomer about the whole character was the, what does everybody want? What does everybody need? Thinking that, you know, because it was a double entendre that I was referring to yep. well, sex and I would, nothing could be further from the truth. And what people don't understand and every kid did understand what I was referring to the plastic head wasn't referring to all sex. And, and, you know, they, you know, a lot of adults who, Oh, you know, you can't say that in front of kids. Why they, they get it. You don't. So get your mind out of the gutter because your kid's mind's not in it. You know, they understand who I'm referring to because I was doing something where if you paid attention, I would get more angry as I did it because I was being jealous of the head. Because what does everybody want? They need love the head. You don't want need or love me. And so, you know, like typical wrestling, you know, one guy gets jealous of another guy. They attack him backstage. Well, you know, in my mind, I think that it's real and that it's stealing my thunder and my spotlight. So I attack it backstage and treat it as if it's a human being, you know. And you never treated it with oral sex, anything like that. It was always just a, a pretty much another character. Correct. It was just, it was a, a, a living, breathing, as far as I was concerned, it was a living, breathing persona. And so, it, it was a character in a video game, I remember, like a full-fledged yes. character. Like, I think it was WWF right. Attitude. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but see, that's, that was, kids got it because it was, they could see and sense and understand where it was directed without the connotations that an adult with preconceived notions has. So. Kids are always right. Parents just don't understand, I guess. Yeah. Now, now, I think I, I saw you say this, but you don't, do you think you're Hall of Fame worthy? No. no. Okay. All right. The, let me hear me out. Okay. okay I think ahead. the I think the nature of the gimmick and the whole head thing might be an issue, but then I have to disagree for the sake of DX. Obviously, like, big thing, but they're telling people to legitimately suck it. Suck and it, then, yeah. And then you have the Godfather, great wrestler, but sure. he literally came out with hose. Do you think that's yeah. kind of hypocritical? I don't think it has anything to do with the gimmick. I, you know, I just don't think that they, that people in general see me as a Hall of Fame worthy uh, contender. I just don't. So get out of here, pal. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think the the like the mid card level, like you were the the top dog right there. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. I'm not pumping your ties either. I know I pumped your ties about your hair, but I'm just jealous. All right. <laughs> <laughs> now you said uh, both your knees were pretty much shot. What other type of major injuries did you have? Did did drugs come into play for your career at all? No, um, drugs didn't. I you know consciously I was scared to death of drugs because I I know that I've got an obsessive personality. So um, you know I I I just knew that it would that would be bad. Um, and uh, for me personally, it was a personal choice. Um, but I've, you know, had, I can't tell you, uh, I broke my right ankle, um, toes and fingers. I think, I don't know, I'm in the teens as far as number of times I've broken a different toe or finger. Um, I'm on my 13th time. I broke my nose. I just recently did that. Um, uh, one time. Um, my, but my neck is fractured in two places on the left side. So it's, it has fused itself. We can't turn my head. Um, uh, uh, pelvic shear, um, blew out the PCL on my left knee. I had them both replaced because they were, they were completely shot, uh, riddled with arthritis and, um, just bone on bone. Um, the broke crack my tailbone in a match, uh, Came home one time after a long, like I've been on the road for 14 days um, and could lean to the side and you could hear my heart click against the inside of my chest. Oh. The sack of fluid that's around your heart from the concussive force of being landed on had swollen and the a rib had been pushed in. And when I would lean, it would tilt the heart, the bag of fluid, and it would, you could hear it click, 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 click. Um, I had... Um, any concussions? Plenty, plenty. Yeah, lots of several. I've lost count of the concussions. You get to a point 
um, when you get you get knocked out because you go down and guys will tell you that you go down like a dark tunnel and like and when you're knocked out when you're knocked unconscious when you come back is when you're coming back through the tunnel and you get the sound and you have the weirdest dreams like you know you swear you're there like I'll never forget like the first one of the first ones I got I got St. Louis and and um, uh, I was coming out of it coming back out of the tunnel and but i was in a biplane flying over a field i think crop dust i don't know what the hell it was on and i could hear the plane feel the wind in my face and my hair and i'm yeah and i said yeah that noise became me going back out of the tunnel and all of a sudden i'm in the ring like what where am i at you know what am i, I thought i was on a plane and um that that's you know you have some really cool realistic place you know you, your mind goes to a different place but you get you get so many of them that you start to go down the tunnel you can actually kind of semi-stop it you know and uh um i did that in japan once i got kicked in the face and dislocated my jaw i popped it back in place and um i had to fight again later that night and uh um got slapped right in the same place and I, apparently i went to dinner, had a great time, joked around. Nobody thought anything was wrong. And to this day, I don't remember anything after getting slapped in the face. God so. damn. At least your memory's good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we have a scan about the concussions that, especially with like uh, such like a hot topic with all of sports, that something may have well, happened. At the, time, at the time, none of us knew anything about it. Yeah. You know? um, and then, you know, uh, I think where it really started to kind of hit home, I was. I'd had two minor strokes um, that, uh, you know, I was diagnosed with and, you know, that luckily, I mean, they didn't do any irreparable damage except for I have a sense of time issue that I can't track time anymore. But really? so I don't five minutes or 10 minutes or an hour goes by. I, you know, I know when events happened, I can remember. I just can't tell you when they happened, what year, what week, what month, you know. I can't keep track of, um, I know I'm married. I just couldn't tell you how long it's been. So at least, you know, you're I'm like, I tell her all the time, look, you don't have to worry about seven year itch. I don't know when seven years gone by. <laughs> That's how was your personal life at that time? Uh, it was, I mean, I, it was fine. I, you know, um, challenging, you know what I mean? It's not easy. Um, being involved or being, uh, and the, the part of the reason I think that it's not easy to be involved with someone who's pursuing a life that others don't live, okay, is that we're all so conditioned from when we're kids that, hey, you know, it's the Ozzy and Harriet syndrome. Hey, you're going to grow up. You're going to get married. You're going to own a house. You know, dad and mom or mom and dad, whoever, going to go to work, come home every night, going to have the weekends, you know. Um, and that's fine. That's good. And a lot of people enjoy that life. But you get a one person that, that that's the life that they've been taught and they've aspired to. And then you get another person that, you know, in order to live a life that others don't live, you have to be willing to do things that others don't do. And the upside to living that life is that I was able to give my family advantages of going places, seeing things, doing things they never would have gotten the opportunity to do. You know, simple as that, making a living that would, they, they wouldn't have been able to have enjoyed if I hadn't pursued that life. But that also meant I couldn't be there every single day. I couldn't right. come home. And a lot of people assume that just because you're there, physically in the home, you're there when nothing could be further from the truth. There are plenty of people out there. You know, I, I had that conversation with some guys who worked at AutoZone and they were like, oh, you don't ever get home. You don't ever see your family. I'm like, how long? How long? You know, what do you work here? At the time, they were like working six days a week, 12 hours a day. I said, hell, I'm home more than you. I said, because when I come home, I'm home. I make up for the time I'm away. I said, you come home every day. I said, you get up, you go to work. By the time you get home, you eat dinner, you sit in front of the TV for two or three hours, you go to sleep so you can get up the next day and rinse and repeat. So I go out and do, I do whatever I do, and then I come home. And when I'm home, I'm totally there. I said, so I'm more home than you are. Just because you're there physically in the house doesn't mean you're home. Right. Go for yourself. Now, how I, did you stay in shape with all these injuries? I just, you just have to, you know, you just, 
we talked about it. I mean, you just have to keep moving. You know, um, you just have to keep going. You know, I and I did my own physical therapy with my knees. I went to a physical therapist for a little bit and then, you know, took it took over and started doing the exercises and, you know, uh, things of that nature um, on my own and rehab my knees. And, you know, I'm still uh, uh, pushing. I just, you know, you got you, you got to push yourself and, you know, you can use it as an excuse. Um, hurt. I can't do anything. You know what I mean? Or you can make the decision that you're going to do what you need to do and then get back to where you need to get back to. So um, that's what I do. You're a different breed, Al. You're a different breed. I, I don't think so. <laughs> now, I feel like when tragedies happen, it affects other people in that moment. You wrestled on a pay-per-view called Over the Edge in 1999. It was the night Owen Hart tragically died. You were in attendance. I couldn't imagine how that must have been for everyone there. I forget, did you wrestle before or after that happened? Right before. Now, how was that for you and everyone there going forward? Because I feel like people do forget about other people that were around. I don't know if you've ever been asked that, or, but I, I, was, very, I was very intrigued. It was terrible. I mean, it was just, you know, everybody loved Owen. And, you know, I, and, you know, you feel it's one thing for, you know, Owen. It's another now for his wife and, and two yeah. children. You know, that's who you really feel for. Because now they've got to go forward without him in their life, and you know that's that's the hard hard, hard thing, you know. And um, um, you know, I'm just grateful that I had the time with Owen and got to experience him and, and you know um, be involved with him because he was he was such a great guy. Um, but it it you know it tore all of us up, you know it it really did because um, we're all so used to just doing. We, we every time we step in the ring, we're taking some risk of suffering a, a life-altering injury or or, uh, or life-ending we really are um you know and that percentage varies based on what we're doing but you know we you know, we're so so uh flippant about the physical risk that we take every day that you just don't equate it to an actual consequence until it really happens and then yeah. when it does it really really hits home you know really makes you aware of things a lot so, and I've unfortunately, you know, I've been blessed because of wrestling that I've gotten to meet so many amazing people and, and, and become friends with them and have relationships with them. And I've also been cursed by that because I've lost so many of them, you know, that I've, I've cared about and, you know, uh, um, will miss when they're gone. Do you think that pay-per-view should have ended right then? I don't know. Couldn't tell you. Yeah. That's not, you know it's easy to armchair quarterback. It's easy to, you know, second guess other people's choices when you're not in the moment and you're faced with that decision. You know, you, it's easy when you don't have the weight of the responsibility that that decision is going to create what repercussions, you know? So yeah, you can, you can sit there and you can judge and condemn or you can condone uh, but either way, you you don't you don't you don't know what you'll do when you're there. There's no way you can. There's no way you can prepare for it. And I don't know if there's, I don't think there's is a right decision. I don't think there's a wrong one. You know, you can make the case of that the show should have gone on. Um, you know, you can make the case that it should have ended right there. But you're making that case based on information that you didn't acquire until after the fact. So it's not really the same as it was if you're right there in that moment to have it staring down the staring down the door wondering what do I do? You know. I feel like that's the perfect answer you could have gave. I like that. Um do you I, have any do you have any Owen Hot ribs on you? Because I heard he was a big price. Uh, he never ribbed he, he, the only he and um uh, Davey um ribbed Marty one time by putting a padlock on one on some of his gear. And it took us like two or three weeks to get the goddamn thing off. Um, it drove Marty crazy because he hated that the other gear that he had to wear and the one that he liked, they padlocked and couldn't get that padlock off to save our lives. That's very um, interesting. And then uh, um, we had, uh, you know, there was Jeff Jarrett told a story once that they, he and Owen went on a, uh, like a, an appearance for the office when we were up in New York and um, they were leaving New Jersey. And as the, uh, Limo was leaving. Uh, 
Owen asked the guy to put the divider up and uh, he start, rolled his window down, stuck his hand outside of the door. And as the car would take off, he'd start hitting the side of the door. And as he'd go faster, he'd hit it faster. So it would boom, 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 boom. And the guy pulls over. He's like, hey, guys, I'm so sorry. It sounds like there's something wrong with the tire. And I was like, oh, is there something that ever with the tire? He goes, yeah, I don't know what it is. He goes, I heard it, man. I don't I don't know. It sounds like it might be loose or something. So checks all the tires. He's like, I can't find anything. I'll just, you know. We'll see if it starts again. And sure enough, as soon as he went to take off, Owen stick his hand outside the door and boom, 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 boom. You know, and it it took forever for them to get back to we were, I think we were at the garden or something that night, and it took forever for him to get back to the garden because Owen just repeatedly would get the guy to pull over, check the car, back in, off he'd go. He'd start pounding on the door again. Then he'd stop, let it go for a while, then he'd start again. The guy'd pull over. So <laughs> Oh man, I always had good stories about that. That's a great one. I haven't heard that one yet. Um, how are fan interactions? What's the most fucked up thing a fan could have done to you or said to you? Anything like that? Nothing really. I mean, the only the only um only thing that I dislike or that is bothersome, I think, is that because uh, I'm grateful for fans. I mean, I you know, without fans, we wouldn't have a job. Um, it's when they they either act too familiar. You know, they'll come up and they'll start patting you really hard. Hey, man, how you doing? And you're like, okay, that's enough. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. who's up, buddy? Um, or um, the one that really gets me is when they try to for, and it's really more them. It's just their insecurities where they try to put you down. They, well, I don't really, I don't watch wrestling anymore. You know, I, I don't know who you are, but could I have your autograph? Well, why do you want my autograph? You don't even know who I am. You're right. You know. Um, or, you know, you're at a party or something and somebody, they tell, say, you know, hey, this is, this is Al Snow, he's a professional wrestler and somebody on me, well, hey, don't slam me. And it's like, well, hey, what do you do for a living? Well, I sell insurance. Well, don't try to sell me a policy. I mean. <laughs> it's like stand-up comedians live. when they go, tell me a joke. And they're like, yeah, okay. Yeah. It's, listen, we don't live in a Bugs Bunny cartoon and a trolley's not going to buy, come by and ring a bell and I'm going to suddenly attack everybody in the room. You know, it's not where I'm going to snap. And, you know, I'm not punch drunk. You know what I mean? It's, it's okay. It's what I do for a living. And, uh, you know, that's it. It's not like I'm on 24 hours a day ready to attack somebody and rip somebody's head off. So. Now you're an author too. The self-help life lessons of the yeah. wrestling career of Val Snow. You must be proud of that. Well, I'm very proud of it. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, we, um, and I have a comic book that's come out, it's coming out now too with broken icon comics the Ballad of Al Snow and Head, and uh, I'm thrilled about that. No um, shit. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, it the artwork, the, uh, the some of the top talented artists and writers and inkers and letterers, you know, were worked on the book, and it's a 40 page book. It's not a wrestling biop thing. It's it's a, a unique uh, story um, where. Uh, I believe I believe in my head, in my skull, that I'm uh, a detective. Uh, I run a detective agency with head and peppers in it, and Pierre, and um, and uh, I go out and solve cases, even though they're really not cases at all. And uh, you know, um, like in this story, it starts with me in the ring, and then I get kind of knocked out or silly, and I go off into this world. Or have this adventure it's a post-apocalyptic world where you know i'm going to rescue this uh, woman's heart um because she said she lost her heart to somebody meaning she fell in love but i think she actually had her heart stolen and uh we'll go through that the next one is where i'm a secret agent and i am trying to infiltrate the evil empire to the north canada um who are our dire enemies um, and because it all happens because I'm crazy, um, each story can be in a different setting. Like, you know, the one is I'm a secret agent. Uh, there'll be one after that where I'm out in outer space, one underwater. Um, and they're all because I'm out of my mind. Um, we've had trying to solve these cases. When does that do out? It's out right now. Okay, um, perfect. 
uh, a very successful Kickstarter. Um, they are, uh, they're, um, and they're, they're going to, they're, um, I'm going to start going to comic cons and, uh, Perfect. make an appearance there and helping to sell, sell the comic. So, and, uh, self helps on Amazon. Um, anybody wants to get it, you know, um, I tried to, uh, write it in a way that it's not like typical wrestling books where everybody's always bitter and yeah. throwing dirt on everybody because I don't dislike anybody. I mean, you know, it is I, what it is. I saw one of your job squad members. I talked to them for a bit at uh, PAX East, the video game for Retromania, Blue Meanie. Yes, yes. Absolute sweetheart. Oh, yeah. He's awesome. He was uh, He's a really good guy. Now, all right. Now I got I to gotta nerd out a little bit to wrap this up because I feel like everybody – most people listen probably isn't a huge pro wrestling fan like me, but I'll do this real quick with you. First off, we'll go not not wrestling real quick. Rudy, you're an extra in the movie Rudy. Yes, yeah, yeah, it was awesome. Got to, you know, Sean Astin's probably one of the nicest human beings I've ever met. I met him later at a Comic Con in uh, Scotland and, and in Amsterdam. It was a terrific person. Uh, hasn't changed one bit. Uh, down to earth, you know, awesome guy, really. That's fantastic. I always love to hear that. Now, is this true? You invented Mr. Sacco. Uh, yes. Uh, Mick and I, you know, Mick came, was telling me what he was going to do. And then I told him, you know, why don't you call, you know, do a sock puppet show for him called Mr. Sacco and all that. No shit. I, I never, I would never thought of that. And I feel like he just talked about that not too long ago. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> now, your Mount Rushmore of most underrated wrestlers of all time underrated yeah underrated that should have been a lot bigger than than what they were given well that's oh man that's tough that's tough uh chris candido would be one i think um george south i think would be another one um bigger than what they were yeah chris candido is a great one yeah, I think Chris is like the top there. Uh, and I, that's, yeah, I, that, I'm not sure. Hey, I'd have to really look that. Still good, yeah. still good. If they come to you later, let me know. Um, sure. Who is a wrestler or a wrestler is that you wish you got to wrestle in your career that you didn't? Um, I think uh, Kurt Angle. Um, because one, he's, he's very giving and, and so am I in the ring. But, you know, like... There are certain guys like when I would wrestle Chris Benoit or I could, uh, I think that, you know, Kurt Angle or even like William Regal, I was, could also, it, you, you could, you could be aggressive with them. You could sell aggressively and you could fight back and they knew what to do and when to do it. And I had the same experience with um, Fit Finley too, you know, where you didn't have to worry and fill in the blanks for them, so to speak. They new and you can make it believable you can make it look like it's a real contest who was the one guy you saw you had a match coming up with and you were like fuck i'm gonna be sore tomorrow oh that was years ago um and that happened a lot and you know one of the worst one of the biggest times and he turned out he was a great guy never touched me was uh bruiser brody you know so i thought i was gonna die <laughs> i feel like hot call holly would have been one no, I, Bob would, you know, Bob would, but the great thing about Bob is Bob would get aggressive and he'd get intense and sometimes he'd get you, but you could get him back. He didn't care. It was okay. It was tit for tat. It's the guys that will take liberties. And then when you do it back, they cry and complain. Yeah. Those guys, you know, but like if you, you know, and I, I tell everybody all the time, like I, I don't mind in wrestling terms of working snug or even stiff. That's, I don't I, well, you won't get a complaint on me, but I'm going to, I'm going to work with you the way you work with me and I can make everything I do look as believable as possible and never touch you. Or I can make everything look believable because I did touch you. That's right. your choice. I mean, I six, one, half, another. And Bob was, we had so much fun, you know, um, and sometimes we'd beat the crap out of each other. So, I feel like he would be on my underrated list. I, the Alabama slam. Was I agree. Me. I agree. It, it, but you know, um a lot not of, under not underrated as in a sense that's like they're they're undervalued no, no, no. no i agree i mean i just i it, what 
the, the key I have found and understood is what we talked about, which is the de that development of who you are. You know what I mean? And what and Bob developed a little bit of that persona, that hardcore Holly persona, that intense, rough, rugged guy. But then you've got to have more depth to it. There's got to be more to it that keeps the audience interested and takes you further. You know what I mean? And um, and, and until you develop that, you can't, you know, you can't get to that next level. You know, so I feel like another. I feel like another guy on that list for me would be D'Lo Brown. Uh, D'Lo, yeah, yeah, I agree. D'Lo was uh, underrated guy too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Can Candido. Yeah, that'd be good. Candido and George South and D'Lo Brown and and uh, uh, Hot Bob. Mm -hmm. talk, talk about a teamwork effort right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, then, with this, um, I you're a professional wrestler. I asked all my guests like what their theme song would be. Being a professional wrestler, you had your your theme song by the WF. You had to pick a personal song. That motivates you that you could have played when you came out what would it be uh probably the one that i used in ecw uh prodigies breathe yeah yeah because it fit the gimmick. it was it was the gimmick the you can youtube that of uh him and ecw and the crowd is going nuts with about a million heads shaking yeah now three things that you're grateful for al three things i'm grateful for yep uh, I'm, I'm grateful for everything honestly i every day Grateful for everything. Grateful for getting to wake up another day. Waking, you know, grateful to have the career that I've had. Grateful for every experience I've ever had. Grateful, even the bad ones, even the negative ones. Um, grateful for, you know, uh, it's been awesome. I, I can, you know, I have no regrets, none, no complaints. I'm just grateful that I've gotten to, that I'm doing what I'm doing. You know, and I just hope that I can keep fooling people long enough to where I can keep doing it until. <laughs> till the wheels to fall head. off yeah <laughs> no yeah, mistakes just, no mistakes wanna, all experiences i want to skid into the into the grave with the with the that car just broken down worn out and tons of miles on it and it ain't got another drop of oil left in her so and, and then we just push it into the hall of fame let it fall <laughs> off we go al snow thank you so very much it was a pleasure to chat with you Thank I can't you. I can't thank you enough and I hopefully you have many more things to come in your career. I hope so too. But, you know, it's only just beginning. It's just I got new stuff coming on the horizon and we'll just see what we can do. Can't wait to pick up that comic book too, by the way. Awesome. Yeah, please. Thank you, Al. Thank you.